Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 437, featuring part two of my interview with the great Colin McComb. This part of the interview, we talk about some of his uh, campaign settings back in his TSR days. We get into uh, Dragon Mountain, we talk about Birthright, we talk about Ravenloft, and of course, Planescape. Uh, so we get all into that game, into the philosophy, what it was like working at TSR at the time, uh, we even get into Colin's uh, beliefs on the nature of evil and what it really means to be evil. Uh, some really deep but also very intriguing stuff. So without further ado, here is Mr. Colin McComb. I saw a little question, a little snippet about that said you're working on Baldur's Gate 3. Mm -hmm. No more context than that. Uh, so what, yeah. what are you doing on Baldur's Gate. Uh, I, I worked with Larian on a contract uh, in 2018 uh, to help develop storyline and themes. Uh, it's a super talented group of people, and I really can't wait to see what the final game's going to look like. It's uh, they are, yeah. I wish I'm very much all the best. It's really, really neat, and I can't say anything more because there's a really restrictive NDA. Hey, you sound, well, you do sound optimistic. That's good. You know, I've had a few people on that they're not working on the game, but of course they're familiar with the Baldur's Gate legacy. And there's kind of a, to me anyway, I'm a, I'm a little concerned. Like, can it possibly live up to that? Yeah. To that, I mean, they, they set themselves a high bar. I sure, I sure hope they uh, they reach it. Yeah, I mean, if uh, if there's a team out there now who can who can do who can clear that bar, Larian is that team. Um, they are they are really talented, really smart, and really devoted to making sure they do it right, and working very closely with Watsi as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on a little bit more into some of your pre-computer game stuff. Now, I was intrigued by a lot of these campaign settings, and every time I read about these campaign settings, if they haven't, if there hasn't been already a bunch of computer games about it, my first thought is always like, well, why didn't they make that? You know, why don't we see more games set there? And there's there's like all this untapped uh, potential, but uh, but anyway, you worked on uh, Dragon Mountain and the Birthright campaign settings, and actually have uh, Janelle. You probably know. I'm sure you remember <laughs> Janelle actually uh, have her painting of that game over there. You probably can't. I don't want to reposition the camera now, but it's that you know nice oh. red dragon. I mean, oh sure. yes, that's it. Yeah, I love that. That's one of my favorite images, just period. So, I, yeah, you know, Janelle sells yeah. the prince. So, you know what the heck? There it is. You oh, can see nice. it <laughs> like a sign print. I'm like, whoa! I just love that stuff. Yeah, it's such a beautiful piece. It's uh, so I mean, the contrast is fantastic. I uh, it just that dragon really pops too. It's one of my favorite dragons. Like, just rendered at all uh, so i was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about this this setting you know i was looking at some of the reviews it's amazing how much how much you can find you know on wikipedia you know even how like the reviewers from back in the day in dragon magazine and what, <laughs> what they were saying about it <laughs> you could spend like uh, days on that and what i thought was cool they singled you out like out of all the people that worked on this you know they said that the, really, the main event worth waiting for is uh, your your contributions, which were books two and three, describes it as a, quote, delightfully sadistic maze of traps, ambushes, and literal dead ends. It almost sounds like a lot of this stuff is, you know, you can see how you developed, you know, into, you brought the same stuff into the computer game realm. But you know, this idea of a rich selection of encounters, making expert use of a layered encounter, where the PCs must deal with two or more perils uh, simultaneously. You know, so it sounds like you were really learning a lot about the, the craft at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, the one of the fundamental uh, inspirations for Dragon Mountain was uh, was an article actually in Dragon Magazine called uh, Tucker's Kobolds. Tucker's oh. Kobolds. Tucker's Kobolds. <laughs> it was. Uh, it's basically, yeah, sure, they're tiny and small, but just think what happens if they swarm you. 
I mean, even if you're a big burly dude, being swarmed by an army of three-year-olds is going to bring you down pretty quick. And now you arm them with, you know, with choppers and cleavers and spears and arrows and nets, and uh, you're not getting out of there alive. So, but yeah, I've, uh, you know, I, I had the uh, had the privilege of working with some really talented people. And for Dragon Mountain, I specifically need to call out my editor, Thomas Reed. Uh, he helped develop some of those maps and encounters. And we talked about all of these things and tried to make it work really well. And I, I can't thank him enough because he was a great sounding board and co-partner on this thing. Yeah, I'm a little curious just as somebody working there at the time. Do, I mean, obviously you're getting these professional reviews, but I would assume you're probably doing a lot, a lot of play testing with people around the office and getting feedback from from players and things mm -hmm, how much yeah. how much feedback were you getting and like how did you integrate it um so play testing time was not built into our schedules we had to make it ourselves um but we also had you know fairly generous uh fairly generous uh schedules for writing these things so we could you know uh, so that included you know making the art order and the map order uh, and, you know, s sort of getting a rough layout to pass over to our editors. Um, so building in that playtest time was important to us as well if we wanted to make sure it was a really good quality turnover. Um, so basically we would just run people through these things and say, okay, now what did you think? What would work better here? Uh, and that turned out to be incredibly useful for developing computer games later on, uh, getting sort of the professional critique uh, before you get it released out into the wild where people say, this sucks. It must be fun. I've had a lot of people on talk about this sort of thrill, uh, which could be a good or a bad thrill, I guess, of watching other people play your, your game and thinking, oh, you're not supposed to go, you're not supposed to do that. What are you, you know, what are you thinking? I mean, what's it like uh, watching somebody else DM, you know, a module um, that you created? If it's a if it's a colleague, then you know you're taking notes and trying to you know pay attention to what people are doing. Like, okay, cool, these are the things that I need to address. And if it's a player doing it who is outside of TSR, uh, it's gratifying, unless they're like, "What the hell is going on here? This thing's a piece of garbage." <laughs> In which case, you go, "Oh." I'm not sure you didn't get that too much. No, no. I most, uh, you know, I most of the time when people are willing to DM something, they have read it and they say, "Okay, cool. This is gonna, this is going to go well with the story, or this fits with this uh, this convention slot." Um, and so they're they're not going to pick something that they think sucks. Um, but so you know, I watching people play something that you have had a hand in creating is. It's really a thrill. It's uh, you know, you're like, okay, cool. I've I've brought happiness to somebody's life. And in return, you know, you get to feed that back into yourself. And it, it makes, you know, it makes the whole creation process feel a lot more like it means something. Um, you know, I, back back in TSR, uh, we didn't really have a lot of internet stuff. Um, you know, I, the internet was still in infancy back then. So we would get the occasional fan letter, you know, like snail mail. Um, and, you know, toward the end of the time there, you know, my time there was uh, 96. Um, so the Internet was starting to really pick up at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've like, talked to people on message boards and so forth and uh, get into flame wars with people and then get yelled at for misrepresenting the company. Uh, you know, when, when, when you're in your early 20s, uh, that's the kind of thing, <laughs> the kind of mistake you make. You misrepresent the company. Yeah, you know, I was getting into argument with Greyhawk <laughs> players, for instance. You know, I was trying to bring Greyhawk back behind the scenes, but they uh, they were arguing with me because they thought I said bad shit about Greyhawk online, and so they started a big campaign against me, and it was it was tragic all around, really. It was not really a big campaign. It was internet drama. Yeah, well, some things never change, I guess. Yeah, it, it felt big at the time. Let's talk about Birthright a little bit, too, because this is a, you know, again, one of these settings I read about it and I'm thinking, wow, there's so much potential here. It sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as I know, you can correct, correct me, feel free to correct me on any of this, but uh, I feel like it was, there's only been really one game, mm -hmm. uh, Synergistic Software, Birthright, the Gorgons, Gorgons Alliance in 97. Of course, that game didn't do too well. Uh, but I wonder if maybe there's still, you know, just because that game flopped, Maybe there's still something there. 
in the campaign setting that would be relevant today. You know, it's got things like Bloodlines. Sounds really cool. Maybe uh, now I'm kind of wondering if maybe that's uh, where some of the inspiration for a certain vampire game came from. But anyway, Bloodlines, characters being leaders, uh, these concepts of domain turns. You know, there's quite a bit in that setting, and I, I haven't played it myself. So, <laughs> yeah, but would you agree that there's still something there worth maybe going back to revisiting? Oh, absolutely. Um, there's uh, I know there's a tabletop campaign that's uh, um, called Seeds of War. Uh, they're going to be releasing shortly if they haven't already. Um, Seeds of War. Yeah. Um, it's a Belgian guy named Nicholas Nyert, uh, and he basically did a Kickstarter for this whole thing. So there's a new tabletop uh, birthright style game coming out. Um, I think it would I think it would work extraordinarily well for a computer game. Uh, just because, you know, Gorgon's Alliance didn't sell well, I think, uh, you know, I mean, it's basically realm management, and then you get to go do adventures. So, um, you know, you get your top-down strategy thing, and you get to make your moves against other people, and then, you know, at the end of that season, you get to see how it plays out, and you get different adventures that you can go off and do. Um, and every different player character class has... Uh, different realm that they're in charge of. So, like, you know, you could be in charge of the Merchants Guild, or you could be in charge of the uh, the temples and churches in this kingdom. Or you get to, you know, engage in old-fashioned politics or wars, or you get to fight for control over ley lines with other wizards. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of potential left in this, and I really hope somebody gets to do something with it sometime. Yeah, it sounds awesome. It kind of sounds a little bit in some ways maybe like Pathfinder, what they were trying to do anyway with Pathfinder Kingmaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's uh, that's really the impression I got from that too. Um, you know, I, I I really like the Paizo guys, so I I have only praise for them. Uh, so, Colin, before we get into the the big setting, I know everybody wants to talk about. It. I just I, uh, to draw this out a little bit more. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering is is there any other settings that you worked on or you were familiar with from back back in the day that you feel like, man, why didn't they ever? Why hasn't anybody ever made a computer game out of this? Ravenloft and Spelljammer both, I think, would be fantastic. Um, you know, Ravenloft being the uh, the realm of dread, it was sort of a, uh, you know, actually, no, I'm, Strahd, I'm getting like Strahd's my possession. And... Yeah, exactly. Um, I, you know, Strahd, obviously the big guy, but also Lord Thoth from Dragonlance. Oh, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, I was I was a huge Ravenloft nerd, and I was a little disappointed that my first project I was on Dragonlance, uh, and not even like the cool part of Dragonlance, but the alternate continent on the other side of the world. Um, but my second project, I got to do some Ravenloft stuff, which I thought was really cool. Uh, and my freelancer on that was Scott Benny, who I wound up later working with at Interplay. Um, he was uh, one of the Star Trek guys. Oh. Uh, Oh, and also, uh, also uh, Descent to Undermountain. So, yeah, I'm surprised Ravenloft. I always wonder how it got. Well, you'd be the, somebody to ask about this. And so it seemed like that game kind of ran into the vampire, uh, the masquerade. Mm -hmm. What was it? some some of that werewolf stuff? Did it kind of get taken over, or some of the light? Yeah. Um, I Ravenloft. Uh, Ravenloft uh, stuck around uh, throughout all of that. Um, you know, I White Wolf had its thing. No, and... White Wolf, is what I'm. Yeah, <laughs> I say Werewolf. <laughs> well, they had they had the Werewolf line as well. Oh. So, yeah, um, you know, I uh, that was a uh, it was definitely more for the, you know, I D and D is you know think of a D and D player and you've got your specific stereotypical image. Whereas if you think of a vampire player, you're, you know, starting to suddenly think, of, you know, fishnets and, uh, you know, spiky hair. And... Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking, I, I ran into that when I was in college. It was right, right around 95, 96. I remember a lot of the sort of goth kids were playing D&D, &D and I was all excited. Like, oh, I can play some D&D. &D. Like, we don't play Dungeons and Dragons. You know, we play Vampire, the Masquerade, vampire, the and all this vampire stuff. I remember looking at it like, yeah, this looks pretty demonic to me. <laughs> That's the point, you idiot, you know. <laughs> my, my mom is going to be like a very angry letter. <laughs> yeah, you know, I felt like I spent all that time trying to convince my folks there's nothing there's nothing sacrilegious about this. And oh yeah, better not let them see the vampire the masquerade and <laughs> show your vampire game and they're like, okay, and today we'll be sacrificing a baby in a desecrated church. Oh yeah. <laughs> Why do we care we're in college? 
All right, so let's get into Planescape then. So just right off the top, what are your thoughts on the setting? Uh, I think it was a masterpiece of a setting, and I am completely grateful to Zeb Cook for letting me play around with it. Um, you know, it was a tremendous gift, um, especially for somebody who was a philosophy major, because then I could be like, yeah, yeah, there it is. I'm using my degree. Um, you know, I, I got to I got to work in mythology. I got to work in philosophy. I got to work in D and D. I mean, it was you know it was okay. basically the Let's sweet spot for me. So, I I was incredibly grateful right, and so humble to, to be up, allowed to dig around in that Christmas setting. Christmas gifts I got. Uh, well, it seems fairly different in so many ways. And I've always uh, I was reading a little bit about sort of the aesthetics of it and Zeb Cook, which he sounds like a pretty interesting guy. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe we could start there. How would you describe him? Well, boy, let's see. Uh, and I would start off with brilliant. Um, you know, he's uh, he's got a he's one of those guys who does his best not to let himself stagnate. Um, he is always looking for cool new experiences. Always looking for ways to improve his thinking. Uh, to create something new and cool and different. Um, he's uh, gruff, I think, would be a good way to describe him. Gruff. Uh, gruff, but also, you know, also really caring and kind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I, I, was, I, was, I was honored to get a chance to work with him, honestly. Yeah, when I was on the Wikipedia page looking up, reading about Planescape, there's a little section on there about Zeb and sort of his inspirations. And that section alone, I think, I want people to go and read that and just look at some of the stuff. You mm -hmm. know, it's really like this these arts, all this artist, uh, I forget the name of the artist, but he was drawing all these like old creepy prisons. And, yeah, Piranesi. Yeah, you know, that's him. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow, looking at that, I could sort of see like, oh, I could see, you know, where the influence was, was coming from. Mm -hmm. you know, who would have, like, who would have got thought to go there, some some place like that for inspiration? Yeah, I, when he uh, when he pulled out the recommended reading list, it was like uh, the dictionary. <laughs> the recommended reading list. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, it was a, a hypertext book, right? So you're like, okay, you can, you know, it's essentially a go anywhere here, you know, almost a choose your own adventure, only like a thoughtful novelization version of one of those. Um, Calvino's Invisible Cities, you know, it gives you a whole different way of looking at the world, um, you know, and also when he recommended that to me, I, I threw me into a whole reading Calvino, and that was, that was, that was a gift as well, so. I, you I, recommended you know, your philosophy? Almost, almost What's that? I was going to, I was wondering if you had uh, recommended any philosophy books for him. Oh, you know, I tried, but he'd read them all. <laughs> <laughs> or was at least familiar with them. So, uh, you know, I, I did talk to him about uh, developing out some of the some of the philosophies for the factions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I can take credit for people getting mazed as well, um, because there was uh, one time we were going to a convention and in sitting in the airport, he's like, I just got to figure out, you know, what happens if like, you know, a, a pit fiend comes into Sigil. What is, you know, how is the Lady of Pain going to stop him? And I was like, well, what if she creates a maze? And so we talked about how all of that would work. And so, you know, I'm, I feel like I get to take credit for that one. So I was reading about one of the accessories, or modules. It seems to be inter interchangeable terminology sometimes for all this stuff. But uh, on the Planescape, uh, for the Planescape setting called Planes of Conflict. And I was, uh, again, intrigued by one of the reviews of it. This is the Trenton Webb. I did write his name down. He's talking about it. He says, A Planescape confirms its position as the premier AD&D world. This is back in the AD&D days. Its hallmark is a bizarre juxtaposition of legend and nightmare. And as such, Planes of Conflict is an excellent, almost psychotic example. It's interesting how these, the same kind of phrases keep coming up when they're describing your work. Uh, anyway, take... almost psychotic examples of the twisted logic that makes the multiverse fun to roam. I'll take it. It's uh, a... <laughs> yeah. Psychotic, twisted. Yeah, I mean, uh, especially... Sadistic. 
uh, <laughs> we we got to go uh, into the gray wastes and the home of essentially you know ultimate evil. So I got to spend some time like okay, here's what the really evil stuff is. So I was reading up. Uh, on like Hannah Arendt and uh, you know the trials of uh, the Nazis in Jerusalem or, uh, in Nuremberg, um, and then reading you know also getting into like the the whole serial killer thing was big at the time, so I was you know into looking at some of that stuff and how people can you know be really just awful to each other. Uh, I was big into Hellraiser at the time, which is oh, uh, yeah. when, when I when I invented the chitin for uh, for D and D. Um, and, and, you know, just thinking about the, the hierarchies of evil and how evil interacts with itself and with other things, uh, I, I, you know, I, I was having some really messed up dreams at the time, too. And almost all of those made it in. So I, I, I'm grateful that people recognize that, you know, it's almost the dream logic of these things. Well, since you are something of a, of a philosopher... Maybe I could just ask you then, what, what is evil? I think lack of empathy, lack of caring, just, uh, you know, I, this, is, this is something I've thought about a lot and I still don't have a really good answer, but I think it's lack of empathy and lack of desire to help others. Um, you know, being completely self-focused and self-interested to the extent that nobody and nothing else matters. So it's it's not hatred. You know, I mean, hatred is really, you know, people have pointed out that hatred is just the flip side of love. It's just that, you know, apathy, essentially, when it's all about you and nobody else. So it's not so much, I want to destroy the world as it is. I don't really care about <laughs> right. you know, anybody else but me. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and there are different flavors of it, you know, there's the whole nihilistic, you know, I want to destroy everything because, well, but at its core, it's because you hate yourself enough or you hate everything around you because oh. it's not like what you want it to be. Uh, or, you know, you want to seize power because you're the one who has the has the best vision of what the world is going to be. And it's, you know, you don't care about anybody else's opinions. It's just you. Yeah, this is really interesting. You know, I often wondered about this system in D and D of the alignments. You now, you probably spent a lot of time thinking about this. I'm sure, and not just for this, but all the planescape and torments and tides. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you feel like you've pretty much nailed it at this point, or are you still kind of wondering, like, eh, you know, maybe this, these aren't quite as nice as I would like? Oh, it's it's There's still so many different ongoing. systems now. I mean, yeah, you know, where do you even yeah. start? Do you have a? Maybe we can start there. What, what's your favorite? Uh, morality or alignment system out there now? Whew. Uh, I mean, the, the D&D alignment system is really cool for what it is, um, but I mean, all of these things are really filters for, you know, it's basically just different filters for looking at the world. You know, Disco Elysium has an interesting way of looking at the world. Um, you know, Tides of Numenera has an interesting way of looking at the world. Vampire Bloodlines has an interesting way of looking at the world. You know, all of these are just, you know, I wouldn't say Say that one is better than the other, and I don't know that I've got a favorite because they're, you know, it's all just perspective. And by by picking one, I'm saying this is the one that I'm going to use to define my life. Whereas, you know, I like to be able to peer through each separate pain. And one other thing about this review that I wanted to mention too or bring up was this idea about Planescape being the premier AD and D world. And I'm wondering, is that just this reviewer's reviewer's opinion? Or was what was it like at TSR? Was Planescape considered like the flagship series? No. Or... Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what I suspected. I mean, what was it? What was it really like there at TSR? And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that first Matt Chat of the new year, 2020. I think this will be a fantastic year for Matt Chat. Already has some great interviews done. I just recorded one a few days ago with uh, Annie uh, Vandermeer. I should be talking all about her new project as well as uh, taking us back to her time of working Neverwinter Nights 2 and Guild Wars 2. A lot of great stuff there. And I'm interviewing Kevin Saunders tomorrow. That's a name you're probably familiar with if you're uh, into that this era of computer role-playing games. Uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, etc. Uh, so if you have questions for him, I'd like to uh, get those in very quickly because I'm interviewing him tomorrow morning. But... 
you know, happy to ask him questions for you. If you can get those in on time, just post them in the comments. I'll check before the interview. And as always, I want to thank you uh, very, very, very much for making Match Head possible, for making these interviews possible. Could not, would not do it without you. I'm just very grateful uh, for, your, for your support. It's amazing to me I'm able to do this now <laughs> all these years just because of uh, folks like yourself who, uh, you know, decide, hey, I like this show. I want to, uh, you know, keep these episodes coming. So you, you know, take a minute, go to that site in the show notes, the Patreon site. Uh, all I ask is a buck an episode. So, you know, if it's worth a buck to you, go ahead and do that. You know, you might find some other shows on Patreon, too. There's a lot of great content coming out. And, you know, instead of watching uh, endless commercials, you just pay a buck or two. You uh, get the shows that you like and you support, you know, not just people, but, you know, the content that you want to see. I think it's a pretty good deal. It's a model I subscribe to, so hopefully you will as well. All right, then, moving on to that news from the Medicaid. All right, quite a bit of news here. First up is a uh, uh, game Banshee has interviewed, let's see, this is Val H, has interviewed Chris Wilson of uh, Grinding Gear Games about Path of Exile 2. Uh, some of the changes we'll be seeing in that game. Uh, so they're billing it as, uh, quote, one game, two campaigns. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, what does that mean exactly? Uh, so what it means is that you'll be able to choose between the original characters in Path of Exile or a new character from the Path of Exile 2 storyline. Both stories end with a map device uh, letting you uh, play the same Atlas map in-game. We haven't decided whether or how players can trade between the storylines, but it's something we'd like to facilitate. You know, so this is a question that comes up a lot <laughs> in CRPG history. You know, what exactly do you do with the sequel? You know, how do you handle people that are new to this series and so on? Uh, so I was kind of fascinated with some innovation in that area. So go check that interview out. I'll post a link in the show notes. Uh, also, Alex Gibson of TwinFinite.net. Uh, let's see, I think I got this link off of RPG Watch. Uh, so they have an interview posted there uh, with LCAT Games' Alexander Michelin about Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. So I've been getting little trickles of information about this project. Sounds really good. As I was reading about what they want to do to make this better than the original, I actually had quite a bit of fun with the, the first game, but you know, I guess uh, you know, other people criticized it. I don't know. You know, some people will criticize anything. I don't know what, you know, nothing's perfect, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, let's see what he says here. Uh, so they thought one of the problems was the first game was too difficult, too complex. <laughs> Maybe it's a better word. <laughs> uh, so they're trying to make this new one, quote, more, and this is a, a Michelin, we want to make this game more approachable to the players, uh, to explain the rules better and make situations that are difficult in terms of the rules more easy to understand. And of course, we are leaving space to think and explore, provide opportunities to learn for those players who want it. <laughs> uh, to make it so, uh, we decided to develop not just some special tutorials, but a whole new learning curve system that spans throughout the whole game helps the players in a number of ways and is on hand anytime you need it. This system will be non-intrusive, so the players who prefer it a bit more old school can play it that way. <laughs> uh, so this sounds pretty interesting. You know, this is one of the big things that you, know, you don't tend to fixate a lot on when you're thinking about, you know, what well, makes for a great game. But, but yeah, you know, you want to have a good learning curve. If you don't know the rules, you know, how can you learn those? Pathfinder is kind of infamous for being complex. Uh, so this is an area, it's probably not the most exciting area, but, you know, if they're able to pull this off, it could be, you know, a really big deal, hopefully something that we can all uh, learn from, you know, especially those uh, working on new games. You know, how could you, uh, you know, not uh, turn away old school players, but provide the information new players need. Anyway, a uh, final bit of news here. This is, uh, I think, really cool. Uh, Realms of Quest Quadrilogy. Quadrilogy collection. <laughs> so, uh, a line of games for the Commodore VIC-20. Yes, they're still making game new games for these classic computers, this, in this case the VIC-20. Uh, so this is a beautifully presented glossy box set 
contain the first four Realms of Quest games for the VIC-20, along with the bonus C64 game, Realms of uh, Ultimate Quest Catacomb. Uh, so this will have a nice box, full-color artwork by artist Oliver Frey. Games presented on two double-sided five and a quarter inch floppy disks in full-color disk sleeves. <laughs> Vinyl disk labels. Wow. Uh, so this is going pre-order January 18th. Uh, so right around the corner. So that's pretty neat. Bet you didn't know they were still making games for the VIC-20. Looks like a brilliant collection. Uh, so I think that'll do it for the news. All right, so just to finish up here, I wanted to share a couple of Christmas gifts I got uh, with you. I think are a lot of fun. Uh, one is from my brother Luke and Dixie, his wife Dixie. They got me a title, <laughs> the Highland title of Lord of Glencoe. I don't know if you can make this out, but uh, I guess this is a company that just for fun uh, sells these titles. You know, so you can go about calling yourself Lord or Laird. And I was reading into this, it looks like what it amounts to is they sell you a square, literally a square foot of this estate in Scotland. And somehow or another, uh, that gives you the right to call yourself Lord of Glencoe. Uh, so I probably won't be demanding that people call me that. But, you know, if I want to take a page from Lord British and go about calling myself Lord Barton, I am not legally entitled <laughs> to do so. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, thanks to Luke and uh, Dixie for that. Nice nice uh, gift presentation, by the way, if you're looking for something unusual to buy your uh, uh, to buy your friends or brothers. Uh, congrats on your lordship. Happy holiday, Luke. It even comes with a little uh, sparkly wraparound. I don't know what to call that. And then my friend Max, he just really went all out. Really touching gift, actually, uh, for me. Kind of I wasn't expecting anything like this, but he saw that I was posting about the uh, Dungeons & Dragons Sapphire Anniversary Dice Set. You know, I've been playing D&D. We, you know, kind of go, Max and I go way back. Probably, I guess he is my oldest friend. <laughs> you know, even back before high school, we'd play D&D uh, &D, uh, together. But uh, to celebrate all that, uh, he got me this Dungeons & Dragons Sapphire Anniversary Set. And it comes with some stickers. But... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we will buy this for the stickers. Uh, it also came with this. This is kind of fun. A nice write-up and a poster about the Sapphire, the adult Sapphire Dragons. Oh, crap. <laughs> uh, that's really cool. But, of course, the reason you get this is for the dice. And they come in a very nice, I mean, it's a very elaborate presentation. It's almost like you're getting a, a diamond ring or something. Yes, I would propose. <laughs> you know, that would actually be pretty cool if instead of the old standard diamond rings, you get the uh, a nice dice set like this. Well, what is this? I didn't even notice this, but before, you know, this like you notice with these collectibles, you really have to look everything over carefully because sometimes the cool stuff is like, you know, underneath the box and like in, under a layer. Uh, but here we have, I don't know if this is, what is this? We believe Dungeons & Dragons has the power to make our world a better place. Thank you for the heroes you've created, the stories you've told, and all the <laughs> dice rolls you've made. Uh, here's to the next 45 years. So there's only, wow, well, only 1,974 of these. And this one is number 1386. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. A lot of signatures here. You won't be able to make those out. And I don't know... If they actually sign that, or if it's like a print. But anyway, it is a limited edition. And then here are the actual dice. Wow. An established 1974. Has a little tassel here. You can open this up. And voila! There are the dice. <laughs> and here is the one that's got the sapphire in it. So it's a man-made sapphire that's built in to the D20. And it's a little bit hard to pull that sucker out because <laughs> they don't want their dice flopping all around before uh, they, they're meant to be rolled, but there we go. Now there's a lot of other dice in there, but this is the, the one. Now supposedly they've carefully measured and weighed all this out, calibrated it so that it's not loaded to make you roll more D20s. Of course you want to see that 
that sapphire right when you roll your crits. <laughs> you know what the hell? <laughs> Let's give it a roll. What do you think I'm going to get? First, uh, first roll with my sapphire dice set. And I rolled a five. <laughs> Let's try it again. <laughs> Wonder what it would take to roll that crystal. Whoa, 17. Okay, a little better. I'll try it one more time. See what we get. Not a five again. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Yeah, you spend all this money, you get the Sapphire collection set. You kind of want to roll the Sapphire. Come on. Nine. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess it's only a, you know, a, a, what, what, a D20. One out of 20. 10% chance, I guess. Is that right? 20% chance. <laughs> terrible. I'm terrible with math. What is the, what are the odds I would get a 20? It's five percent chance, right? Five times twenty is one hundred. <laughs> I'm hopeless. I'm gonna try it one more time. Up oh, four. Oh, I'm getting even worse. But anyway, uh, thanks to Max, beautiful set. And look at what else we get there: a D12, a D, another D20 looks like. Of course, your percentile dice. Now oh, this will be fun. So all of them have the fun. D&D logos on these. <clears throat> you know, they are official uh, Wizards of the Coast dice. So anyway, I'm not going to keep going on and on about this, but, you know, thank you very much, Max. Very beautiful set of dice. Going to have a lot of fun with these at the, at the table. All right, so let's wrap it up with a quote. And so I was looking for quotes about evil, and I kind of got goosebumps. You know, sometimes serendipity happens. It's almost like the universe is talking to you. But there was a, when I when I typed in, like, quotes about evil, J.R.R. Tolkien popped up. I'm like, what's this got to do with anything? So this is timely. So there is, there's a write-up about some lectures he did. Last, I guess he had a habit of doing these Christmas lectures on various topics uh, for the Natural History Society of or Oxfordshire. Uh, so this is an author, let's see, Joseph Lacanti was writing about this for nationalreview.com, article called Tolkien's Deadly Dragons. So you see why, like, like the goosebumps are happening. Like, like, you know, like, Tolkien, dragons, uh, evil, you know. <laughs> uh, so I thought I'll, I'll set this up a little bit. Uh, so they're, you know, like I said, they would have this conference every year, do these uh, lectures, and this one was it had coral reefs, birds, whales, and horses came up. Uh, but one of them, one of the categories was dragons. Uh, so they got none other than J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, this is 1937-38 uh, to do uh, the part about dragons. I mean, how awesome is that? I mean, I would have paid any amount of money <laughs> to be able to, to sit in a room and listen to Tolkien talk about dragons. Uh, anyway, you can read the lecture, uh, and then they talk a little bit about who Tolkien is. I mean, come on, if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> know who Tolkien is. <laughs> uh, anyway, here is the part. Uh, so here's the quote. It's kind of long, longer than usual, but I think it's worth uh, quoting at length. It goes something like this. This is from the lecture on dragons by Tolkien. Quote, dragons can only be defeated by brave men, usually alone. Sometimes a faithful friend may help, but it's rare. Friends have a way of deserting you when a dragon comes. For the dragon bears witness to the power and danger and malice that men find in this world. And he bears witness also to the wit and the courage and finally to the luck or grace that men have shown in their adventures. Not all men and only a few men greatly. So ponder on that and see you guys next time.
Boys and girls, go back to your studies. Believe me, nothing in life is free.